Hello, uh, James Sykes, CEO and President of Baseload Energy Corp. Here with another educational video for you. Uh, it's kind of about uh, time that I got another one of these videos done. So what I want to do is now that we've expanded our portfolio outside of the Athabasca Basin, I want to answer a couple uh, simple questions that I keep getting asked about. Why are we exploring outside of the Athabasca Basin? I've got a number of videos planned actually for down the road. So this one here is actually going to be part 2A. Of, of another video that will be recorded shortly and and so you guys can view. So this one's basically, we're looking at uh, fluids and basin tectonics, really to help you understand you know, how mineralization actually occurs um, just with the whole redox process, but also the role of the Athabasca Basin itself. So let's get on with this. And, you know, general disclaimer, I do note that I may make some misgeneralizations of some scientific processes. You know, I'm not an expert in all of the fields that I'm talking about, but what I do present uh, is a very simplistic concept that is meant for the non-geologists really to understand uh, where I'm coming from and, and understand the processes that are involved. I also want to point out the ore group, Baseload is part of the ore group, fantastic group of companies, all helmed by Mr. Stephen Stewart. Uh, the guys, he's put a wonderful group of companies together with some uh, very well-educated and let's just say technical expertise in each of the companies. So, uh, you know, if you're tired of Netflix or Disney Plus or whatever the heck you're watching these days, please go to YouTube, search for the ore group, and then check out the videos that we have on there. It, it, you'll learn a lot about each of these different companies, looking in gold, looking in copper, uh, baseload being the uranium company. And I guarantee you that you will, you will learn a lot and you'll be educated. And hopefully you will appreciate what Stephen has done with the ore group and continue to follow each of these companies uh, individually or even as, a whole, as the whole group themselves. So the questions that I keep getting asked. Do you need the Athabasca Basin fluids to form uranium deposits? If you do need them, then why has Baseload staked the properties outside of the Athabasca Basin? This is actually a fun presentation for me, and I, I hope you guys really enjoy me trying to answer these questions. So let's kind of get going on this. Fluids. I love fluids. It's all part of the whole structure system. So why do we need fluids? Well, they've all got different chemical and physical properties, and it's a key to understand which ones actually play a role. So redox is the one that we are really looking for, and that's a uh, electrical chemical potential trap. So redox is redox is responsible for roll front and Athabasca U redox uh, examples, which I which I will show, and then we'll look at. It, tectonics as a it very generally but the formation of sedimentary basins so we'll look at the Athabasca Basin which is a historic ancient basin uh, 1.75 billion years old and then we'll look at the Himalayas which are still currently forming today and then we'll look at some of our properties and give interpretations of uh, why we think where we have staked is key for being underneath a sedimentary basin at some point so why fluids? You know, it's not just about health benefits. Uh, fluids are not just about water. They've all got different chemical and physical properties and reactions. So things like salinity, emissibility, uh, thermal, electrical. But these, uh, you know, fluids are responsible for forming a lot of mineral deposits that we see today. So again, it, it, it's key to understand why we actually, or it's key to understand fluids. So why they form uranium, or for our example, why they form uranium deposits. And like I said earlier, we're looking at that electrical chemical potential. An example here, salinity. You got fresh water meeting salt water, and you can visually see it, and it, and it forms a nice barrier that you can, you can visualize. You've got oil mixing with water, but they don't actually mix. Now, it's not like adding, uh, adding food coloring to water where they blend in. No, the oil stays separate from the water just because of the two properties don't mix between the two fluids. And you've got something simple like uh, temperature. These are both water. You've got water and you've got ice. Just one's at room temperature, the other one's below zero. So simple things like temperature as well. And then you've got batteries. Well, what the heck are batteries doing in here? The whole concept of batteries and, and how they actually produce electricity is all based off of redox. So the the process that forms uranium mineralization is the same process responsible for producing energy from batteries. 
So to understand redox, we're going to look at the nucleus. Okay, we're going to look at the atom and the electrons floating around. So back to your, uh, you know, back to your high school chemistry. Very simplistic. We've got our neutrons in blue, which don't really add to the story. Then we've got our protons, which are positively charged in red, and then we've got the electrons in their shells flying around the nucleus in green. And those are negatively charged. So you've got three positive charges and you've got three negative charges. You add those up, you get to zero. That's a very stable situation. However, when you kick one of these electrons out, goodbye, you now have a different charge to the whole atom. Now you've got a three plus charge and a two negative charge, which gives you a one plus charge. This is equivalent to being in an oxidized state. But what has now happened to that electron that got kicked out? Well, that electron, he's just floating along in the, the giant sea of the atomic scale. And then he comes across and meets another atom of the same, uh, the same or even a different, uh, a different atom. And now, so you've, you've had something that was originally stable, it has accepted the electron, and now it changes as well. It is now negatively charged because you have three positives and four negatives, which gives you a minus one reduced state that process there that is simplistic redox it doesn't get any more trickier than that but that process in itself creates an electrical charge and you can actually visualize this you know whether in mathematical formula um which is probably one of the easiest ways to actually visualize it like in this this uh this picture in the background here and redox in this in this graph is here you can see it jump from a very low state of energy to a very high state of energy in almost uh, the blink of an eye. That's redox. That's exactly what we're looking for. And that is, that's the key to uranium mineralization. So oxidized above, which is positively charged, reduced below, which is more negatively charged, creates that boundary. So redox is a chemical reaction in which the oxidation states of atoms are changed, which I showed with the, with the atoms. And that's done by transferring electrons between the elements and that transfer creates an actual boundary, just like the salt water example and the fresh water example that I showed with a very you know, clear boundary, you get the same type of boundary. And this creates two different environments. You've got an oxidized or oxic environment, and you've got a reduced or anoxic environment. So the oxidized environment is rich in, in oxygen, uh, the water is our environment, whatever it is. In that scenario, uranium is soluble and mobile in oxidized fluids. That's very key to note. However, in a reduced environment, which is very oxygen poor waters or the environment, uranium remains solid and immobile in such fluids or environment. You can see this uh, with, uh, with iron as well. Iron's uh, you know, similar to uranium. It's very mobile under oxidized conditions. So in any deep lake or even in the oceans, you do have a naturally formed oxidized uh, redox potential, which where you have iron coming down from fresh water, it's all oxidized, full of oxygen, it just gets to a point where there's, there's no oxygen available and becomes reduced. So, so that, that, that layer transfers iron oxides into iron sulfides. You can, and again, just another example of looking in, in the natural environment today. On the left-hand side, you've got a wonderful oxidized environment. You know, flowing rivers, lots of fresh rainwater uh, open to the environment. Whereas on the right-hand side, you've got swamps and bogs. This is a reduced environment because the waters that are underneath the, the vegetative cover are not being oxidized. They're, they're, they're basically trapped. There, there's no exposure to oxygen. All the vegetation is taking up the oxygen, not the waters underneath. So with something simplistic like that, you can see it in the real world. And again, one of the easiest examples to even to even conceive about ox, uh, the redox potential, you have reduced chain. So a natural iron chain, nothing's done to it. You expose that to rainwater for you know, how, however many days, years, weeks, whatever that becomes oxidized because the iron will rust. The iron, when the rainwater hits it, which is very oxidized, the iron will become soluble and go with the rainwater. So over time, this rust will actually continuously remove iron from the chain and eventually it will completely uh, completely erode is, is the way to look at it. 
So again, natural processes, we see it all the time in the real world, but I don't think we really understand it. So hopefully what I'm doing here is, is, is getting your brain thinking along sides of, uh, of the redox potential. So another way that we'll look at it is also uh, comparing redox to flocculation. I'm just, uh, they're not really the same. I'm just using this process, the flocculation process, as a fractal example for what we are going to see. So flocculation is basically a process in which you've got uh, particles that are suspended in the water, in this case, and then they flocculate. You add something to the water and everything just flocculates and it becomes a precipitous mass at the end. So this is, you know, you take a form of, it, sorry, it's a form of concentration. We're going from a dilute solution to a very concentrated mass at the end. And again, this is natural, this is chemical, this is physical, this is a whole bunch of things all occurring. This is a fractal process in nature. So what we are going to do is consider the left-hand example to be our oxidized. So just like water, um, just like water hitting that iron chain, the iron goes into the water and it becomes soluble and it moves with the oxidized water and it stays in that solution until it becomes reduced. And it's at that boundary, that oxidized to reduce boundary where everything just, boom, comes together and creates this precipitous mass. However, however, we are going to take it one little bit step further because remember what we are looking at. We are looking at uranium that is solid to begin with. We're not looking at uranium that is already oxidized. No, the uranium has to become oxidized. So when it starts out, it is in a reduced condition so it's already a mass, and then it gets oxidized with oxygenated waters and hits the redox potential and then re-precipitates. And that's how all of our uranium deposits uh, in roll fronts in the Athabasca, that's how they're all formed. And that's how they get concentrated into these larger masses and higher grades. So we're looking at things like solubility, solubility mobilization, concentration, and deposition. So uh, just an example of roll fronts, because for me, this is much easier to, to understand the whole process of redox. You've got your granites, you've got your aquitard, uh, let's call them clay layers. So they don't allow water into the actual stratigraphy of the aquitard. They will, uh, they'll exclude water. But then you've got your aquifer, which is, let's consider it a sandstone, which will allow water to flow through all the pore space within. Now let's, let's assume just, you know, this is all very generalized, but let's assume that this aquifer has a starting concentration of 2 ppm uranium. So again, it's starting out as a solid. The uranium, little, tiny, extremely micro tiny uh, fragments of uranium are within the sandstone at a concentration of 2 ppm. And then we have rainwater. However many years, millions of years, hundreds of millions of years, continuous rainwater. And as it flows down on the octard, it flows down. It doesn't penetrate through. However, where the rainwater is actually hitting the granite and going into the, into the aquifer, or even just hitting the aquifer in itself, it will penetrate through and continuously flow within that aquifer. So as that starts to happen, if you notice that red little blip, I'll do it again, up by the top of the aquifer, you start to... Um, oxidized your sandstones be and with that process remember uranium is going to be soluble in oxidized fluids so as the water comes through the aquifer it will leach it will take the uranium with it and it's not until it gets to a proper condition where it drops it out but each time it does each time that it keeps moving it continuously builds and builds and brings uranium with it so at some point and even over time, your aquifer is going to have an oxidized front, which will basically have no uranium left in it. All of the uranium has been scavenged. But where it's dropping everything out is at that boundary between the oxidized environment and the reduced environment. And because everything has now been scavenged from up above, it is being deposited in the redox front, that this redox front is now concentrated. So we've gone from something that has 2 ppm concentration to now 2000 ppm concentration. This is how we get our economic deposits. And you can see, you can see the color of everything too. Uh, you've got your red oxidized layers above. You've got your 
yellow mineralized layers, which are uh, basically your ore zone, ore zone and their redox. Then you've got your gray reduced layer where nothing has happened. That's just natural. No oxidized fluids have hit there. But even when, when we're looking at a plan map here, you know, this whole process is huge. It's, it's, you assume a sandstone layer that just continues for a very long time, uh, for quite a distance, uh, many tens to hundreds of kilometers. <clears throat> but why don't you get uh, uranium concentrations or these roll front deposits occurring along the entire redox front? I honestly cannot answer that for you, and that's not my intention of answering it. I'm just pointing out that uh, it's along this redox boundary in certain locations, which is why you get your ore deposits. Now, there is a little bit of a trick to the structural side of things in the Athabasca Basin, which I will touch on in the next presentation. So looking at the redox fronts again, uh, that EH potential, that's that electrochemical potential. You can really see in that pink line, when you're oxidized, you've got higher voltage. And once you hit that, that redox front everything just drops out you you lose everything right away and that's redox you can see it visually you can see it on the chemical scale you can you can measure it electrically so it's actually a very cool process that you know understanding this helps us with our exploration and in the Athabasca you can see it you can see your oxidized zone on the left hand side which is basically a lot of your red and then your reduced rocks on the right hand side, which are all your white clay alteration, your gray rocks. But most of these in the Athabasca are all controlled with structure. So this is something that again, I will touch on in the next video. This one's cool enough as it is. All right, we'll get there. Athabasca Basin, so what actually is a basin? A uh, basin's very simplistic, it's a bowl. Yeah, you wash your hands and you brush your teeth. Um, it's wide round open container for holding liquid. So a container for holding liquid. Well, in the geological landscape of things, let's look at a basin formed in a mountain range. Now you've got, on the upper image, you've got a lot of uh, mountains and they're being eroded with sediment being transported along the river system and depositing into that bowl, into that basin. You can see in the bottom image now that there are, that the sand has been accumulating in different periods of time with different uh, different uh, type of features to it, hence the different colors. But as the mountain belts keep eroding, you keep moving those rocks and sand down to form in a basin. But even the sandstone in the bottom picture there, uh, those three layers of sand, they are still filled with water. Okay, so it's not it's not like the water is being squeezed out; the water is still there. So in the Athabasca Basin itself, this is a picture of the sand dunes just south of Lake Athabasca. It's an intercontinental sedimentary basin. So this was formed in a mountain belt. It was about 1.75 billion years ago. Okay? So it is, it's, it's quite old, and we're gonna use some analogs to figure out why, why we think that where we are is lucrative for still holding fluids. <clears throat> and there, there, there's still fluids in the Athabasca Basin today. We know that, we know that for a fact. And we know that the Athabasca Basin had a lot to do with uranium deposition. So again, why did baseload stake outside of the Athabasca Basin when we know we've got a lot of unconformity deposits in the Athabasca Basin as itself? Is there a trick to it? And yes, of course there is. This is why we're doing this. So we're gonna play with Google Earth for a bit too. We're gonna jump back and forth here. <clears throat> Here's the province of Saskatchewan. This is the shadow property. This is a recently staked catharsis property. I'm not gonna show Hook because Hook is basically adjacent to the Athabasca boundary, which would be covered under this red uh, ellipse. So the red ellipse, as you will see throughout multiple images, is going to represent our Athabasca basin. Now a shadow is about 30 kilometers south of the basin. A catharsis is about 75 kilometers south of the basin. So quite removed. What I want to bring your attention to now, though, is this green line that I've just drawn on here. To the west of the green line, or the left, this is your, this is the Rocky Mountains. If anybody has ever been to BC or even uh, just starting off in Alberta, you go through the Rocky Mountains. Wonderful mountain range, very scenic. And if you look at this image, you can start to see, see some linears going to the northwest. So I've just highlighted some of them there. 
uh, just very briefly in the blue. Now that's something you can see from the sky today, from satellites, you can see these linears, okay? And when you put the gravity, uh, I guess regional gravity over this, uh, you can see the same linears, right? Uh, at least I can see them. And if you look at this image, you kind of get these spaghetti-like images or linears going to the northwest. So if I redraw them on, you can see that where I saw it visually in the um, in Google Earth, I can actually see them in the gravity survey as well. So why did I cover up everything Saskatchewan in blue? Oh, that's because I mentioned before that it's an intercontinental basin, okay? The Athabasca Basin is an intracontinental sedimentary basin. So it was formed when two plates were pushed together and created a huge mountain belt. Now, some of the theories I've heard were that the uh, this trans-Hudson orogeny, which is what this, this historic or ancient mountain belt used to be called, forming around 2.2 billion years ago, not million, billion years ago, so it's very old, was larger than the Himalayas are today. So if we want to find uh, if we want to find the roots of this ancient uh, mountain belt, because we know it's not a mountain belt today. If anybody's ever been to Saskatchewan, it's flatter than anything. So we can see the roots using the same gravity survey, and you can get the orientations out of these. Now, a lot of the ones that, that we're interested in are going to the northeast, and so you, you can you know you can kind of see these things for yourself, but I'll just, again, draw a few on there, and you can start to see even some curvature to them, but you get the idea that, these deep roots are still prevalent from the old mountain belt, but we know this as a mountain belt. And you have the Ray, Her Ray province to the left-hand side of that black line and the Hearn province on the right-hand side of that, or right-hand side of that black line, that, that one black line between the two uh, texts, that's basically the suture point where two, <clears throat> two massive plates collided. Okay, zooming out, Google Earth. We got our Athabasca Basin. Uh, if you note my scale there down in the bottom left, uh, 5,400 meters high altitude, okay? Now we're going to jump over to India and China. Same scale. Scale hasn't changed. Still there. So why did I come over here? Yeah, I'm talking about the Himalayas. Well, let's go to the Himalayas and actually see what's going on. So you've got the Indian plate pushing up against the Eurasian plate. And that process is creating the Himalayan mountains. So we have a modern day analog to work with that we can interpret what we're seeing today to correspond with what we what would happen two billion years ago. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to use this area as an analog to interpreting the Athabasca Basin. So looking at the Himalayas, that's a huge mountain belt. You can see it just goes for rows and rows and rows upon rows, but they're all you know they're all arranged in a certain pattern, and you can see how deep some of these things are. Oh, this is this is a wondrous mountain belt. I've never been myself. I'd love to go one day. Getting back to it, what do we notice in the Himalayas? Well, we notice this. What is that? That's a sedimentary basin. Wow, just like the Athabasca Basin, there's one forming today. This one's called the Tarim Basin. Okay, so now we have a modern analog for working with sedimentary basins. Remember, my scale hasn't changed from the Athabasca, so if I draw the same ellipse on here, you can see that the Athabasca Basin, what we see today, is much smaller than the Tarim is. What's the reason for it? Let's find out. So here's the Tarim Basin. Again, just kind of circling that. You can see it's a, you know, it's a nice desert uh, bounded by mountain belts on either side. It even has some inflows and outflows. Oh, look, the shape of that matches with what we see in the Athabasca today. That's pretty cool. All right. So we've, we've got some good starting points. Now, in the Athabasca Basin, there are multiple layers of um, sedimentary formations. Also note, there's the Virgin River Shear Zone. This is uh, the tectonic boundary between the Ray and the Hurden Province. So basically, your Indian plate colliding with the Eurasian plate. And so along the Virgin River Shear Zone, which if, if you know from my previous uh, uh, documentaries, that the shadow properties along the Virgin River Shear Zone. Uh, catharsis is now slightly to the southeast of all of this. So here's your A, here's your Hearn, butting together. Let's take a look at a cross section, or let's actually take a look at a long section through the Athabasca Basin, okay? It's the Athabasca Basin, I guess, is 400 kilometers long, along the long direction, and about 200 kilometers uh, along the cross-sectional, along the cross-section of it all. 
So yeah, now let's look at the at a cross section of the actual basin. And we will distinguish between the different sedimentary layers. Um, they're different depot events. So that means they happened over different times. So I don't know if you can see them here, but I'll highlight them in blue. Uh, you can pick out that the geometry of these is what really gets me. They look like they've been eroded. You know, sedimentary basins do not form like this. There's usually a uh, plateau type of feature where things, you know, where you hook up, I guess, to the feeding river systems. We're not seeing that here. They've all been eroded. But different depot systems over different periods of time. It's a typical sedimentary basin. All right, let's look at our properties. Again, I've mentioned this many times. Our properties are all outside of the Athabasca Basin. We've got Hook, which is right beside the basin, so that's why I don't really you know, talk about it. It's more about shadow and catharsis. Were they in the basin at some point? Let's look at a different example of the uh, cross-section of the Athabasca Basin. I'm pointing out on this one, if you look right now to your right-hand side of the screen where it says RY, circled in red, this is called the Riley Subbasin. Now the belief is that this Riley Subbasin is part of the Athabasca sedimentary sequence. So if you see between the Riley and the actual Athabasca itself, there's no sandstone there. Yeah, again, it's been eroded. So we do believe that at some point, the sandstone did cover between the Riley to the Athabasca, and if so, then the idea would, that, the idea would be that it was much larger at one point in time anyway. So this is what we can work with. So let's go back to our wondrous example, Google Earth, good old Google Earth. There's the Riley Subbasin, now that little small dot. Let's actually throw in another basin just to the north of us, the Thelon Basin, just to make this a little bit more interesting. So now we've got three sedimentary basins all in this area, all dating to around the exact same time. So probably all due to um, intracontinental basins, so formed in mountain belts. Let's look at some uh, work back from Paul Ramakers in 2006. Well, Paul Ramakers is probably one of the best sedimentary geologists uh, in the Athabasca, uh, quite a reputable and well-knowledged geologist. So let's see what Paul actually did back in 2006 and his ideas. So this is looking at the, the Thelon Basin, looking at the Riley Basin. So I guess, okay, here's, here's Shadow first of all, here's Catharsis, here's the Athabasca Basin, here's the Riley Subbasin, here's the Thelon Basin. So this is um, at one point in time, this is what we're actually seeing today. This is what we've got dated. However, we do believe that there are, that there was something on top. Before I get to that, I just want to point out, you know, all these structures that he has had um, on, on his image here. Now I'm just going to play around with a few things a little bit here. And everybody knows from previous presentations, my fascination with the lozenge features. I'm just going to make a couple edits and boom, look at that. Isn't that quite unique? You know, so on the structural sense of things, I see that shadow and catharsis are in the proper areas. This is exactly where we want to be. We want to be on these massive structures, but in the proper place along these lozenge features. Let's get back to what Ramaker is, is suggesting. Now you see this, these two purple blobs, okay? They're huge, but the idea, they may not connect with the Riley Basin, they may not connect the Thelon and the Athabasca, but the idea is that there was at least five kilometers of strata that was above our current basins that have been eroded. So whether they all attached or not, honestly don't know, but again, I can't, can't dismiss that idea that we're pretty confident there was more sandstone cover on top of the current Athabasca Basin. So that means it would have been larger. How do we help explain this even further with our modern day analog, the Tarim Basin? I'm gonna take this image, I'm going to superimpose it over current day Athabasca. So here we go. This is where we are. Here's our Thelon. Here's our Athabasca. There's our properties. I'm going to take that image, same scale, nothing's changed, and superimpose it. Look at that. The Tarim Basin, which is our modern day analog, can stretch between the Athabasca Basin and the Thelon Basin. If we are under the impression that five kilometers of sandstone have been eroded from the Athabasca Basin, over billions of years, which makes, you know, from a geological perspective, makes a lot of sense, then we can suggest that the Athabasca Basin was much larger back when it was forming, back when uranium event was occurring at 1.5 billion years ago. So this modern day analog really you know, puts things into perspective that the shadow property 
the hook property, catharsis property, were all at one point underneath a sandstone basin. Now, the other thing to note about the Tarim Basin is that it's not done forming. This is still active tectonics. The mountain belts are still forming. Once you stop, once you stop tectonics, and once those mountain belts start to erode, that basin will grow. So even though it looks like maybe shadow and catharsis are not inside the basin as it is, uh, inside the, the, the Tarim Basin analog, that Tarim Basin will grow. And so at some point, those properties would have been under the, actual, the Athabasca Basin. So if all of the uranium is coming from the oxidized fluids within the Athabasca Basin, and you had to have that formed uh, 1.4, 1 1.5 billion years ago, and the Athabasca Basin started forming 1.75 billion years ago, there's a very, very, very good chance that our properties were underneath the Athabasca Basin. Okay, if you take some of the some of the linears from the Himalayan mountain belt, just looking at uh, looking at the visuals of it, and we'll shade this out a little bit so that we can superimpose the the gravity, uh, the regional gravity that we see in Saskatchewan, Alberta, BC, and again, kind of fits that with what we're seeing in the Tarim Basin. Same orientation of that mountain belt really coincides with what we're seeing in you know, in the past. So modern day analog has really helped pull together um, the historic observance. And again, there's our, there's our lines, lines drawn from the previous gravity, so all oriented the same way. Let's, like, let's take a cross section through the Turin Basin. Let's just keep building on the story just a little bit more. So we'll look at a cross section through the Turin Basin. Here it is, this is what it looks like. Yeah, I'm gonna note on the left hand side of this image, there's a scale there. And that scale goes from, uh, it's, about, it's about a 12 to 14 kilometer depth. Okay, that's, that's really deep. With what we know about the Athabasca Basin today, what, what remains is that it was, it was only about 1.5 kilometers depth with what remains. If there was another five kilometers on top, then that would give us six. So it's still half the thickness of the Turin Basin today. But let's take that. Let's take that Athabasca, Athabasca example and put it on the Turin Basin to scale. There it is. So our remnant after 1.75 billion years of erosion and glaciation and things just scouring the earth. And again, we've gone from the Himalayas, you know, some, a mountain belt that was larger than the Himalayas to the flatlands of Saskatchewan. That's a lot of erosion. So could the Athabasca Basin have actually been much larger than even having five kilometers? If, if we take this to, I guess, if, if we take this as, you know, the penultimate example, but we put our properties here. So we've got shadow and we've got catharsis on there. Well, then definitely, yes. No, if, if this modern analog has anything to do with the historic occurrences, then yes, our properties that are currently outside the Athabasca Basin would have been covered with sedimentary sequence, would have had those oxidized fluids continuously flowing along the property. So in this example, do we think baseloads properties were once covered with Athabasca sandstone? Yes, it's pretty simplistic. However, I wanna just go one step further and let's look at the geometry of the Athabasca Basin. So here, we'll look at that. Let's assume that maybe it wasn't five kilometers eroded, or I guess in this example, yeah, it's pretty close. Looks like maybe four kilometers. But in this example, again, we're just looking at the geometry, just that lower basin bowl, everything around it, everything on top kind of escalates out. And it, it does make a lot of sense, because if you see on the left-hand side of the Athabasca Basin, which matches with the trim, there's, there's a sharp drop-off. And you can see that in a lot of places along the southern and western side of the Athabasca Basin. The, 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 the unconformity, I guess, between the basin rocks and the sandstone is very sharp, and that's structurally controlled. But that doesn't mean that the sandstones on top stop there. And again, we consider the Riley Basin being further to the, uh, to the east, so on the right-hand side of our Athabasca Basin, it would still fall under this additional sandstone sequence that is gone. So let's throw in our properties here. Let's throw in the shadow, let's throw in catharsis, still within the basin parameters, you know, using the scale that is still there. 
perfect. So we, in this example, do we think the baseload's properties were once covered with Athabasca sandstone? Yes. So even though we are outside of the current day Athabasca Basin, and if we need those Athabasca Basin sandstones to carry uranium, if that, if the sandstones were the source for uranium, which I'll touch on another on another presentation down the road, but if they were the sole source for uranium, then I'm very confident that both, all three of our properties, Hook, Shadow, Catharsis, were all under the Athabasca sandstone during uranium mineralization event. I'm very confident about that. But, but, we don't want a but. What if baseload's properties were still never covered with the Athabasca sandstone? Ah, oh, we don't want to think about that. Uh, what are the chances for uranium discovery then? Ah, they're still good, don't worry about it. But I'm not going to answer that this time. We're going to look at that in the next video, okay? There's a little bit more going back on structures and fluids. It's another exciting, uh, another exciting video. But I'm hopeful that you took a lot away from this, that, you know, baseload has a strategy and a reason for what we are doing. You know, we believe that our properties have the right merits to make discoveries, to make high-grade discoveries. It's just a matter of being, being able to explore them even further and making those uh, dreams and realizations come true. So, to summarize everything we've seen, fluids are important for uranium deposits. Absolutely. You've got an oxidized fluid and a reduced environment or a fluid. Okay? That's your redox trap. Baseload's properties had access to those ancient oxidized fluids. Now, I'm pretty conf confident about that. Was there a redox system established on baseload's properties? Ooh, that's a good question that I didn't really touch on, but again, we'll look at that next on the next video. I'll just keep you guys uh, uh, keep you guys wanting more here, I guess. So the follow-up presentation, which would be part 2B of this whole um, oxidized fluid system, will start to look at the fluid pathways outside of the basin. So if we're interpreting that there was no sandstone cover outside of the basin, do we still have access to? continuous oxidized fluids and my answer is yes so can we identify the possible sources of uranium bearing oxidized fluids we'll look at the structural controls and the fluid mechanical pumping uh, with with a fault system and we'll look at the fluids and at the basket deposits themselves and the big thing the big takeaway from that presentation will be the geophysical interpretation of the fluid alteration system that we think we can see today and what they actually mean for baseloads properties. I want to thank you very much for watching this. I'm glad that this is uh, only part 2A because part 2B would have been much longer and you know just you can watch it at your own pace. So thank you very much for, for watching. Again, Go to the Ore Group YouTube channel. Check out some of our other videos. Check out some of our some of our uh, uh, our other company videos, and just help yourselves to educating yourselves with uh, with the Ore Group and with our geological expertise. So stay safe, even though the the vaccines are slowly rolling out. Stay safe. Mask up. Sanitize. Stay healthy. And we'll catch you guys on the next run. Thank you very much again.